Last summer, my husband and I visited Washington, D.C. Many of the museums were closed uh, or there was limited access. But, so we were very fortunate to get into the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, I could have spent an entire day there or more, but as it was, we only had four hours, and so we only skimmed the surface. The music and entertainment exhibits included uh, Chuck Berry's 1973 bright red Cadillac convertible, which is really fun to see. And I was so impressed that in just about every exhibit, there was an equal representation of both women and men. So there was uh, much to celebrate there, but of course, there was also much to mourn. For me, uh, probably the most sobering display focused on lynching. I have to say, I thought I was just gonna be uh, sick in the corner um, as I read the accounts of um, African American men and women who uh, were physically brutalized. Maybe you saw this morning, the Senate has passed a federal anti-lynching law. It's now on President Biden's desk, and I imagine he will be signing that. Well, this haunting picture is reminiscent of Christ's own death, and that's something that you and I as believers are thinking about, especially now during Lent. We think of the forgiveness that we have in Christ based on his death on the cross. But Paul preaches about another aspect of Christ's work. Christ made peace by making the two one, that is Jew and Gentile. Paul talks about that in chapter two of Ephesians. Christ creates one new humanity, one new anthropos in himself. And this new people, they're members of God's household. Paul talks about this new humanity as the body of Christ, and Ephesians will develop this metaphor of the church as Christ's body in several ways, including an emphasis on oneness and unity, and also a focus on maturation and growth. This morning, I'd like to focus on this aspect of oneness that's created by the cross. In Paul's world, society is highly stratified. The social structure was built on three basic pairs of subordinate, superordinate, a system that Aristotle advocated centuries earlier. So you have the wife husband, the child father, and the slave owner. This construct shaped the family structure and by extension, the city government. I think it's important for us to realize that Paul was given these social categories and then there's another social category, Jew and Gentile, the people of God and idolaters. Paul presents the work of Christ's cross and resurrection within this cultural construction. So if we turn to Ephesians chapter two, verses 11 and following, I want you to imagine a group of about 20 or so believers listening to the letter being read there in Ephesus. You've got Jew and Gentile sitting together, slaves and owners, freed men and freed women. That's a category. When someone was a slave and they were manumitted, they didn't become free in that sense. They, be, they joined this category called freed men and freed women. They still had obligations to their uh, previous owners. So you had freed men and women sitting there, um, perhaps one or two wealthier people who were hosting the gathering. And maybe the letter to the Ephesians was read by Priscilla. She and her husband Aquila served the Ephesian church and she was a teacher. Or perhaps Aquila read it. My guess is though that it was a Jewish believer who read the letter as Jewish believers seem to be the leaders in the first generation of the church, which makes sense. They would have had the background and the knowledge of scripture. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, the context is Gentiles in Christ, sharing in the grace of God, being raised and seated with Christ. In verses 11 through 13, Paul reminds the Gentile believers of their recent past. That's one of alienation from God. They weren't part of the citizenship of Israel. They were foreigners to the covenants, foreigners to the promises. They were without hope, 
Paul says they were without God. But they're not left out in that wilderness, for the blood of Christ brings them near. Paul goes on to say in verses 14 through 16 that Christ is our peace. And this peace has a creative, active energy to it. It creates a new entity before God, a new people based on God's promises that those who are far away would be brought near. This peace makes the two one, which is another way of saying, by grace you have been saved. Simultaneously, the believer is forgiven and made new, reconciled to God and to their enemy. So the scope of Christ's work on the cross extends from our personal forgiveness to remaking the people of God. And it's done in this sort of single, sweeping, redemptive motion of death, resurrection, ascension. So in verses 17 through 22, Paul elaborates on this peace that makes Gentiles fellow citizens with Israel, God's people. And this is a Trinity community, as through Christ, we have access to the Father by the one Spirit. So Paul imagines unity as uh, a temple built on Christ's work. That's an interesting metaphor or image that Paul uses because in Ephesus, there is a huge temple, temple to Artemis. And Artemis was the goddess who watched over her people in the city. The temple was many times larger than Athens Parthenon. In fact, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And these Ephesian Gentile believers would have seen parades of devotees marching through the city up to her sanctuary. Indeed, they likely participated in such rituals before turning to Christ. But now they are to imagine themselves as arriving at a different temple, as being a different people. And so Paul extends this image of temple to describe this one new people as it functions in the world as a holy place, representing to all around the one true God. Well, how might this unity be expressed in Paul's congregations during worship? We have these great images, this deep theology, so how does it live itself out in Paul's community? Let's turn to Ephesians 5, verses 18 through 21. When you look closely at these couple of uh, verses, you find that Paul commands the believers to be filled with the Spirit. And then he adds uh, five additional participles that explain what being filled with the Spirit means. It means speaking with psalms, singing and making music, giving thanks to God the Father, submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ. This is describing the house church. I'd like you to think for a minute, imagine your sports team or your theater group or your mission team, maybe your dorm floor getting together speaking in psalms to each other, singing praise, offering thanks to God. Can you also imagine what it would be like to uh, submit to each other? What does that look like, submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ? In Paul's case, it means stepping out of society's prescribed hierarchy and caring for your brothers and sisters as though they really are your brothers and sisters. Now, I wrote that down, and then I thought, wow, I, I don't actually know about your brothers and sisters and how well you actually treat them, so I don't know. (laughs) But you should be nice to your baby brothers and sisters. All right. How did this work in Paul's world? What was Paul hoping the Ephesian church would hear and then do? Well, we can see what he might be thinking by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 and following. This is a passage on communion. Paul sharply rebukes the Corinthians for disregarding the body, that is the church, because they were denigrating the slave and the free poor who arrived at the meal later than the rest. Paul declares it's an absolute disgrace to eat heartily in front of another who is hungry. Paul says, don't don't even call this the communion meal. Well, why did the Corinthians act this way? 
The social custom of Paul's day was to distinguish people's social worth by giving important people meat and fresh fruit, giving them variety, and then giving those further down on the social ladder hard bread and, well, in my case, it would be lima beans or Brussels sprouts. I'm sure you have something to fill in the blank there. Uh, the poor would get very little to eat, and, and the slaves might get no meal at all. And Paul is saying, that there's no wonder that your community is weak, so lacking in God's strength, because you're humiliating those who have nothing. Today, we tend to miss the social reality of this text when we view it only through the lens of personal piety and personal confession of sins. To submit to each other out of reverence for Christ means, in Paul's case, that an owner might offer food to his or her slave, or a father might serve his daughter. Supporting each other meant bearing the social shame or dishonor that some carried in the church, especially slaves. It might mean that the wealthier in the church supported Christian businesses. For example, it may mean that the Gentile believers visited Prisca and Aquila's shop. They also lived in Corinth for a time. Uh, frequented their shop when they needed uh, leather repairs, even though these Gentile believers might be shunned by others in their family for supporting a Jewish business. Paul indicates that believers should submit to each other out of reverence for Christ as he describes this worship in the house church. And then Paul moves to discuss categories that made up the ancient household, including slaves and the institution of slavery. We'll turn uh, to chapter six, verses five through nine. I think this is one of the hardest passages in scripture for American Christians to read or at least it should be. Our history of racialized, institutionalized slavery haunts us to this day. It's a slavery that was built on a myth of triumphant whiteness. And I am sharing my ideas with you today, very cognizant of my white skin color. In a, in a recent hermeneutics class at Northern Seminary that I taught, um, an African-American female pastor spoke about her frustration with Paul's, well, these are my words, anemic, I, I think I'm capturing her thought here, response to slavery. I respect her opinion very much, and my exegesis of this passage will not be able to do full justice to the complexity of the ancient institution of slavery or its modern counterparts. And, and I can... I can only weep at the way this passage has been used to promote violence and the particular form of violence in our country, uh, racism. I would have loved for Paul to have shouted against the institution of slavery here in this household code section. There's not shouting. But I do believe that Paul destroys the foundations on which slavery was built. For it was built on the practice of domination, the domination of some over others. In Paul's day, slavery was horrible. It, it wasn't racialized the way the American experience uh, was, but it was equally horrible. And it may be that there is even a history of slavery in Paul's own family. It may be that his father or his grandfather were enslaved, for example, during uh, Pompey's crackdown in 63 BC when he goes into Jerusalem, uh, or the Roman governor Varus who put down a revolt in 4 BC. This is when uh, Herod the Great died. It is a practice in the ancient world, uh, I don't know how common it was, um, for the owner to put his or her, uh, put in his, or her will uh, that their slaves could be manumitted at their death and be given Roman citizenship if the owner was a citizen. So Paul may even have some personal history with the institution of slavery. As we turn to this passage, verses five through nine, I'd like us to uh, highlight a few points. First, I'd like us to remember what is promised in the letter to the Ephesians to all believers. Paul declares in chapter two that every believer has an inheritance. 
and that would be amazing news to slaves. Remember, a slave has no legal parents, they have no legal descendants, they have no family. However, in Christ, the slave has a family. She's a member of God's family, and that includes an inheritance. We cannot underestimate the, uh, we cannot overestimate the power of these words to Paul's congregations. And then second, Paul honors slaves by speaking to them, in fact, speaking to them first, before addressing the owners. In fact, it's a bit astonishing that Paul speaks to slaves at all. If you look at uh, most of the Gentile writers at this time who wrote on slavery, the owners are the only audience that they have in mind. And Paul's letter, of course, is read aloud in public in the church. So everyone hears that a slave's obedience is seen and valued by the Lord. Paul indicates that a slave's work, although mandated by her owner, is nevertheless an opportunity for her to model the character of Christ. The labor and the humiliation can be done as though to Christ himself, and that gives those actions value and a promised reward. Third, Paul declares here that slaves can do good things. Now, I know that doesn't sound radical maybe to us, but it was revolutionary at the time. Slaves were seen as inferior, made so by the very institution to which fate had consigned them. And they didn't lose that when they were manumitted and became freed. They still bore that humiliation from a social standpoint. The Romans believed that a slave must be beaten in order to work hard and speak truthfully. And we see this especially in the courts where slaves were uniformly tortured before they gave testimony. And we see this in the church, uh, this happening to uh, believers in the church. In the early second century, Pliny the Younger, who's a governor of Bithynia, he writes to Emperor Trajan about, what do I do with this new group called Christians? How do I handle them? This is in letter 10. Um, he indicates that to find out more about Christianity, he tortures two female slaves who are called deaconesses. And he laments, well, he discovered nothing but depraved, excessive superstition. But the gospel, we know, proclaims God's kingdom, which admits no social hierarchy. Its king is a crucified and risen Lord. The early Christians did, did not tackle the Roman legal system, but they acted counterculturally by treating slaves as full members of their community. Paul notes that God has prepared good works for all of us to walk in. You can see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And he challenges the Ephesians to do good works with their hands so as to share with others and to speak what is good or helpful to build others up. This is at the end of chapter 4. Both slave and free, then, all the believers who are listening, are under obligation to do good deeds and to speak good thoughts so as to bless the church and live out the gospel among all people. Paul describes here in chapter 6, he describes slaves as having the capacity to know God's will and to do it. And that is an astonishing statement given the prejudices of the day. Paul elevates the slaves' deeds as those done unto Christ, effectively undercutting the evaluation of the slave owner. And then what does he say to the slave owner? Verse 9 of chapter 6. These owners, who would include men and women, perhaps even some freed men and freed women, Paul says masters are to treat slaves in the same way. Well, what does Paul mean? In the fourth century, uh, the church father Chrysostom argues that Paul was urging slave owners to serve their slaves. And such language fits Jesus' words that uh, one who leads should be a servant of all. This you can find in Mark 10. At the very least here, Paul orders masters to follow the same principled behavior as that enjoined for the slaves because the Lord tolerates no special treatment for the socially privileged. Well, not only are masters to do the same thing, they are to cease threatening their slaves. Do not threaten, Paul says. 
Now that threat might be the use of a whip, or it may be a threat to sell uh, a child, uh, or uh, a partner. Slaves couldn't marry, but they, they did have informal unions, and uh, the owner could threaten to separate that union. The owner could threaten to deny food, or drink, or proper clothing. Taking away the owner's power to threaten violence, and to say nothing of the opportunity to actually commit violence, taking away the threat of violence undermines the very, abil uh, the very ability of the master to control their slaves. And Paul does not put a caveat in here that disobedient slaves can be threatened, although you may read that in some older commentaries. The domination that characterized the institution of slavery has no place within the church. Well, what does it mean that Paul uh, talks about Christ as master or Lord here? Paul does not project earthly characteristics of owners onto Christ, but he rather invites believers to think differently about what Lord means. Who is this master or Lord in heaven? Well, it's none other than Christ the Lord, the one who was crucified for others. Who, while we were sinners, died for us. This is the one who shows no favoritism, who does not count social status as determining one's worth, who welcomes all into his family, his body. In our country, it's I think it's arguable that Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin did more to shift public sentiment against slavery than much else. She revealed in narrative what exegetical arguments had trouble mustering, and that is the human in the center of it all. The human element is poignantly displayed when the runaway Eliza and her son arrive at the doorstep of John and Mary Bird. You know, the couple in the story had just been discussing the fugitive slave laws that require uh, someone to return a runaway. And Mary Bird says, God commands me to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, and that would include runaway slaves. But her husband, who's a senator, responds, well, but that could lead to harm because of general public unrest. Mrs. Bird doesn't have, she doesn't believe that. And even more, she says, or she believes her husband would not turn away a slave fleeing from their owner. Well, their servant interrupts them, asks Mrs. Bird to come into the kitchen, and then shortly after, Mary Bird invites her husband John into the kitchen, and there they see the ragged and half-frozen Eliza with her little boy Henry Suddenly, the couple's debate shifts from the abstract to the real flesh and blood, the real flesh and blood mother and child who need their help. Suddenly, it was personal. And for Paul and the early Christians, it was also personal. About 20% of the early Gentile believing communities were slaves, and there may have been more in Rome because Rome had a higher percentage of slaves in the population. Each of these believers, including slaves, was co-heir with their fellow believers. Chapter three, verse six. Each was a stone in the Lord's temple. Chapter two, verse 21. A slave might be a pastor, an evangelist, or teacher. Christ's gift to the church. Chapter four, verse 11. In fact, tradition holds that Philemon's slave, Onesimus, became bishop in Ephesus. And we saw that Pliny tortured two female slave deaconesses, their leaders, in the congregation. The slave children and the freeborn in the Ephesian church worshiped together alongside their slave, freed, and free caregivers. Paul identifies each believer as his brother and sister, which gives slaves a family. And Paul establishes slaves as able to discern the will of God and model service of Christ. So it gives slaves moral authority within their community. 
And Paul warns masters publicly that the Lord watches them and is unmoved by their so-called high social position. Say, slave and free are alike before the throne of grace. The Lord himself, though being in very nature God, yet took up the very nature of a slave. That humiliation that through obedience resulted in Christ's exaltation. Orlando Patterson explains in his book entitled Slavery and Social Death, Christ, quote, annulled the condition of slavery in which man existed by returning to the original point of enslavement and gave his own life so that the sinner might live and be free. The scope of Christ's work on the cross extends from personal forgiveness to remaking the people of God. Our society today is shaped to favor white persons over people of color, to favor Protestants over Catholics and Jews, the wealthy over middle class and poor. What we need to embrace is the profound truth that God shows no favoritism. Reconciliation in Christ between all believers reminds us that not only is the individual redeemed by the cross, praise the Lord, but the cross creates a new humanity. We're invited to live into that new reality. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.